Good afternoon, LinkedIn. Andrew McCaskill here, dialing in for uh, the first Job Search Hacks Live and Q&A of 2021. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're keeping your spirits up. It might be a new year, but we seem to be facing a number of very, very familiar challenges on the job market. So here we are. Let's see uh, where we go from here. And it's delighted. Uh, I'm delighted, I should say, not it's delighted. I'm delighted that you've chosen to join us. So thank you very much for doing so. Um, for those of you that are new, welcome. You might not have been with us last year, but what I can tell you is that you're just about to engage with one of the most collaborative and supportive job search communities on the internet. I can absolutely guarantee that for you. We're here to help. We're here to help you get clarity and get confidence on your job search activities and try and help you navigate all this madness, right? Because it's an incredibly testing time, no matter where you're based in the world. There's a number of challenges around getting hired at the moment, and we want to give you as much information as possible to help you achieve your career transition and get fixed up in something that you're passionate about. So as I said at the start, I'm Andrew McCaskill. I'm the founder of a, a business called Executive Career Jump. So we're on a mission to end job search misery. And I spend my time doing two things, really. I run the Executive Career Jump Club, which is a membership, online membership for leaders on the move to help them with their transitions. And I'm also hired on a one-on-one -on -one basis to help executives uh, perform better, I guess, at each stage of the job search process. So what we tend to do in these calls is a mix of things, really. Number one, you've got a great chance to connect with other people in the stream. So if you want to connect with people in the stream, make it clear that you're open to connecting. And you can do so really easily just by hovering over the picture on people's profiles. It will come up with the, uh, the opportunity to connect. So recommend that you do that. Build your networks out. Number two, the other thing you can do on this stream is you can ask any questions. We're happy to take questions on anything job search related. And what I'll do once I've spoken for a few minutes and we've given everybody enough time to find the link and join and all of that is I'll start putting questions on the screen and we'll give you the best, most honest advice that we can around how to solve your particular job search challenge. So it could be about CVs, could be about LinkedIn, could be about uncovering the hidden job market and the opportunities there or networking or presenting, or maybe you're starting your own business and you want to talk through that. Anything career or job search related, I'm absolutely up for tackling it for you. We love any interview questions in particular, and we're going to share openly. We're going to give you tangible data-led advice, right? There's lots of advice on the internet. There's been 40, 50 new job search coaches enter into my space over the last 12 months. In a way, it's brilliant because more and more people are getting support, but it does mean that people are getting lots of different ideas. So, I want to give you clarity based on the data. And we helped over 200 people last year get hired. Based on that data, I want to give you clarity around what you need to be thinking about. Because as I say, there's some familiar challenges. Now, what we do know from previous uh, lockdowns, and everybody, no matter where you're based, seems to be in some kind of form of lockdown at the moment, is that there's certain things that are going to set you up for success. And in the Executive Career Jump Club members kickoff call that we did on Tuesday, I went through it in detail. But... One thing that's worth you all thinking about and one key learning from the last lockdown is the importance of structure. So when you're in the job market, it's so important that you're structuring your days. We even talk about leaving the house to go and do a fake commute. Yeah. To kind of refresh yourself of getting out of the house to then almost coming into work as if you're coming into a job. Because make no mistake about it, when you're on the job market, you are the CEO of your job search. That's how you've got to view it. And you've got to treat it like a full-time job because in this market, it is one, I promise you. So structure's important. Plan out your time. Have certain activities in your outlook. You know, use different techniques to help you focus. Some people like the Pomodoro technique where you have some time on and some time off or an alarm going off to give you permission to interject with yourself. Scheduling plenty of uh, time with friends and family at home. And also a really nice uh, tip is to have an area of the house or your apartment or a room, if you're lucky enough to have a spare room that you can use, which is where you go to work on your job search. Because to minimize distractions, it really helps our brain to have a particular place in our home whereby we're working on the job search. Because if you're trying to work on your job search in the kitchen where you normally eat, um, you'll find you're triggered to go to the fridge all day rather than be as productive as you like. I'm sat uh, in my dining room right now and I feel hungry. That's how our brain works, right? We anchor certain activities to certain places in our home. If you normally watch television while you're on the couch, 
and you're sat on the couch trying to job search, you'll tend to find you switch the television on anyway in the background and then it can distract you. So overwhelming tip is find a place in your house whereby you go to undertake your job search activities. So without further ado, let's get into it. What you need to know? Well, for a start, if you can add any value to anyone's questions, please do reply and share your own insights. I don't want it just to be all about my answers. You're all working your way through all this stuff with me. So please do offer your insights to other people. We really, really value that. Make sure you connect with people who are happy to connect. Just, as I said earlier, hover over their picture and use the reaction buttons for me. That's super important. And if you want to take screenshots at any point or if you want to follow up and do any posts around what you learn and all of that kind of thing to help me promote the sessions and to help build the community, please do. And please use the hashtag Job Search Hacks Live because I'll find it and I'll help uh, get some more eyeballs on it for you as well. The final thing to mention just before I switch over is this is an open public environment, right? So if you are in role at the moment and you find yourself in the stream because you're looking for a role, uh, but you're currently employed, then please be aware that, you know, anything that you say, this is an open source environment. So I wouldn't share anything that was confidential or give away the game too much if you're stealthily looking for a new job. So I'm going to go over to my new screen here. I'm absolutely pumped for today. This is uh, the first session we've done uh, in a few weeks. And I've missed it. I, said, I was saying to Zoe this morning, I've really missed the energy and the engagement that it comes from these sessions. When we set off doing this sort of 10 months ago, I had no idea in terms of how it was going to build and grow over time. So thank you all. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with you all again. So looks like we're up and running. Fantastic. Let's dive into the comments and the questions, see who's in here and say hello. Gary Flett's in here. Hey, Gary. Gary's got a petition. He'll probably share that at some point that we're really supporting, which is to incentivize companies in the UK to hire available. So we'll try and get that on the screen a little bit later. But if you can support us, please do. Richard Morris is in here. Hello, you. Nadine Sharma. Hello. Neil Young. Welcome back. Uh, Louise Silk. Fantastic. Xavier has joined us. Keith Chalice has joined us again. It was a great contributor last year. Christine Howard's in. Christine puts out some really interesting content. She's a member of the Executive Career Jump Club. If you're not connected and following her, you should be. Uh, Nicola Ashforce in here. Stephen Telford. Michael Kelly. Paddy's in here. One of the Career Jump Club members who got fixed up on a contract recently. Another really good guy to follow in terms of uh, some great videos in a big hat. Where can you go wrong, eh, with that kind of strategy? Rob Pritchard's in here. Neil Dixon's in here. Susan's joined us. Hello, Susan. Lovely to see you. Glenn's in here. Uh, another Career Jump Club member who's worth you following and um, sharing advice with. So great to see some of the Career Jump Club guys turning out uh, to share what they're doing. Uh, Alex uh, Burnham, thanks for joining us again. Another great contributor from last year. First question. So if you want to ask a question, just write the word question and then pose the question. I'll put a cue in front of your question and that will help me fish it out the stream because you'll find these streams kind of move quite quickly. Paddy's up first. Hey Paddy, how are you doing? Firstly, happy new year and, and to you and to everybody else on the call. Can you share your advice regarding the job search vacuum? This was essential advice for myself, treading that fine line during my job search. Yeah, I'm happy to share that. So this is something we shared in the Executive Career Jump Club, isn't it Paddy? Um, so what Paddy's talking about here is these communities that are, we're creating around job seeking and people on the market helping each other are fantastic. And during lockdown in particular, when job searching can feel very isolating and very frustrating, I think the camaraderie has just been awesome. And I think we should be doing all we can um, to support each other's content, to share and like what people are doing, to just amplify anybody who's on the market to help, help them try and attract an opportunity, right? So that's what we've all been doing, and, and, it, and it's awesome. But there is a danger of it, and there is a downside to it, unfortunately. And, and that is the job search vacuum, which, which Paddy's uh, talking about here. So the thing with LinkedIn, and we you know, I'm a LinkedIn addict, right? I live on this platform, and we're looking at changes and things all the time. But LinkedIn have got far, far better at continuously feeding you stuff that you've engaged with previously, OK? So as the platform's grown and grown and grown, and what are we, like 770, 780 uh, members now or something, as it's grown and grown and grown, in order to keep your feed more and more relevant, it feeds you more of what you've commented on. So you've got to be careful of creating a job search vacuum or a job seeker vacuum where you only comment 
and like uh, posts from other job seekers. Because what you will find is you create this ecosystem where everything in your feed and everybody who's seeing your content are other people on the market, right? So whilst that's all great activity and I commend anybody for helping champion and support others on the job market, you've got to make sure you're liking, commenting, connecting and sharing towards your target market as well. Because the idea of the content strategy is absolutely about um, support and well-being and community, but it's also about attracting opportunity. And out of the 220 odd people we helped find a senior role last year, more than half of those came via LinkedIn in one way or another. So if you're only engaging with other job seekers content, you're going to miss out on your target audience getting enough eyeballs on what you're doing. So please bear that in mind. I hope that makes sense. And if you've got any thoughts on that, let me know. Use the reaction buttons if these things are helpful. Sean uh, Purnell's back in. Good to see you, sir. Uh, he's very happy to connect. So hover over his picture if you're happy to connect with him too. Richard's happy to connect. Christian's back in. Happy New Year, Christian. Again, really good guy to follow in terms of some content and another one of our members. Uh, lots of good stuff uh, coming out of him. Will Summers is in as well. Hey, Will. Same story with Will. Shares a hell of a lot online. Got a lot of value to add. Oh, I can't see your name, but sounds like another uh, success story there, which is fantastic. So whoever you are, congratulations on your seven month contract. We're still seeing an increase in interim and contract roles, right? It feels less risky buying decision for hiring teams to offer a contract than it does a permanent role right now. So we're going to see this trend for quite some time. So if you're not already in touch with agencies who specialize in interim and contract. If you're not already optimized on LinkedIn for interim and contract, do so. You need to make sure that you're looking both interim and perm. There's an argument that actually the quickest way to a permanent role right now is to start as an interim. Because once you're in there, and it's so much easier to influence a, an organization from the inside rather than from the outside, right? So that's my advice on that. And well done, whoever you are, well done. Rob Spates in here and happy to connect. Ayumi's joined us again. Welcome. Uh, back. Jillian's up for new connections as well, which is absolutely brilliant. Lots of people joining us. A couple of hundred people also in here already. So looks like, yeah, as, as long as people keep showing up for the, the sessions, we'll keep doing them. Looks like there's going to be demand this year as there was last year. So it's great to see and thank you for joining me. So if you've got any questions, just put a queue in front of what you want to ask. We can talk anything, LinkedIn, CVs, interviewing, anything like that. We're happy to talk about networking, social media, personal branding. Uh, so this is the petition I was talking about that uh, that we've kind of been supporting with Gary, which is we're currently petitioning to incentivize companies to hire people who are out of work. So please do review that. And if you can help us champion it, that would be huge. Mariana, welcome back. Lovely to see you. How are you doing? Once you've applied for a job, is it acceptable to find the line manager for that position and send them a LinkedIn message informing them that you've applied for the job and attaching your application? Yes, it's absolutely acceptable. It's also recommended because job advert response numbers are through the roof. Uh, statistically, you've got less than a 1% chance of getting an interview from a job application in today's environment, right? So it's a low hit rate, which means don't spend your entire time applying for job adverts. You need to be doing other stuff as well. But what it also means is that we need to try and move those odds in our favor a little bit. And it's a great idea to link in with the hiring manager and send them a message. But I wouldn't just send them a message saying that you've applied in a, and attaching your application because that feels like duplication and a little bit dull, if I'm honest. So what we would recommend is you, you link in with them and you send them a voice note. So you go into your messages on your LinkedIn app, hold down the voice message and talk to them, Maria. Pitch yourself in. Say, hey, I'm Mariana. Uh, really good to be connected. Thanks for accepting the connection. Typically, I help people like you solve their pain and change for the better. I actually saw that you're uh, in the market for somebody at the moment, so I've made a formal application. But for me, the leader I work for is really important. So I wanted to reach out directly as well. And a lot of what you're doing and what you stand for resonates. So I hope we get to meet at some point, right? Something nice and simple like that. The other option could be to send them some of your content. But for me, I really like the voice note at the moment. I think it's so personal and it's so hard to ignore. So methodology, absolutely fine. Uh, totally appropriate, but do more than just inform them uh, that, that you've applied. But try and influence the thing, yeah? Push it along. That would be my uh, that would be my suggestion. So who else is in here? Samuel's in here. Mateus Flodin's join us. 
another guy shares a lot of good stuff on the uh, digital side, which is good. Remember to put a queue in front of your questions, please, if you can. Okay, got some questions coming through now by the look of it. Keith, how are you? What are your thoughts on applying for roles that are located in different parts of the country? Yeah, so what I would do in uh, that scenario, the first thing I would do would be to change, take your full address off your CV for that application and just put United Kingdom, yeah? So that you're not qualified out based on location when you make the application. And I would go for it. I think if you could find a way to make some kind of mix of remote working and commuting work for you, then it's got to be up. You've got to be up for it. A lot of people are open to remote onboarding and predominantly remote working now. We've seen obviously a big shift in how workforces are being organized and being made productive. So I would encourage you to go for it. Just remove your current location off of the CV so that it's not a barrier. Georgina, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us and the other 200 odd people that have, have turned out again. When you've applied for a role through LinkedIn, are you able to see your progress? Uh, no, you're not, unfortunately. Um, it often does drop into a black hole. As I said earlier, you've only got a 1% chance of securing an interview, okay? Like I'm not making that up. Statistically, you've got a 1% chance. So it's very feasible that you could apply for 50 roles and not get an interview. And I see, you know, when I start working with some people, they've been going through this cycle for a few months and it's really demoralizing and it starts to erode your confidence at a time that you most need it. So first of all, check yourself into job ad advert rehab, do some other stuff, get some content going, get some networking going, work with some headhunters and recruiters in your niche, all of that stuff, because you can't, you can't see the progress. You can't see the progress. And I totally hear you about this black hole thing. It's demoralizing, isn't it? It's no good. Neil's joined us again. How are you, sir? As an experienced senior finance professional, I can add value in many areas of the finance function. Should I tailor my CV and LinkedIn profile to be more of a generalist or focus on a particular area of my strength or expertise in order to max up, maximize my chance of securing a role? Very, very, very good question. So CV and LinkedIn form two totally different parts of this puzzle, Neil. So the first thing to say is we need to uncouple these things. You're not going to do the same thing to both. And I'll tell you why. So linked, if you think of uh, job searching as like a funnel, LinkedIn is at the top of that funnel. CV is the next stage in the funnel, in the middle of the funnel, and any marketing people will tell you about funnels. Then you've got the interview, offer, and, and start, right? And so your job when you're on the job market and you're the CEO of your job search is to optimize each part of that funnel, right? But LinkedIn sits before the CV. So with that in mind, LinkedIn needs to be broad for all the things that you'd want to be found for. And that is the aim of your LinkedIn profile, ladies and gentlemen, is that it's optimized to be found for the buzzwords that you want to be found for. So, of course, it's turned on so that recruiters can see it, but optimize for SEO so that any headhunters searching find you. So think about what the key buzzwords are going to be on that job description that might be relevant to you. And if there's a few of them, that's fine. Just include them all. Include them in your headline, your about box, under each role that you've had, and just make it really, really buzzword rich profile, but broad on LinkedIn. Then from a CV point of view, what we recommend on the CV is that you have a CV that's structured in a more functional way. So you have an objective up the top, then your six or seven key career achievements is the first thing that people see, because people don't want to go fishing for your achievements in your CV. I want you to hit people between the eyes of them. Then you have a skills section before you get into your background. Now, in terms of tailoring your CV for each role or tailoring your CV for an application, it's the skill section you need to tailor. And by having that skill section there, rather than going through the whole CV and trying to tailor it, it allows you to quickly update one particular section, keep the rest the same, and then make applications or make direct approaches for specific skills. So I hope that helps. We're going generous LinkedIn, but then a skills-based functional CV that you tailor based on the types of things that you're looking for. It's a real annoyance, isn't it, that people want to pigeonhole you uh, so much. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from. You said to optimize for contract and LinkedIn. I did. Uh, how do you do that, please? My pleasure. So what you do is you, um, I would put interim or perm in your headline. So along with all the buzzwords and the things that you want to be found for, I would put interim or perm. OK, just to make it very, very clear up front that you're open to interim or perm. And I would also mention that in your about section, potentially in your career section. And as I said earlier, I would get out there and make sure that you're connecting with recruiters who specialize in that space. So, yeah, looks like we've still got 
over 200 people in it, which is fantastic. Keep the reactions coming because they really help me, uh, as I said, when I'm looking back to see what kind of stuff's helps me my own content generation as well. Tony, how are you, sir? Can you discuss the age bias by recruiters in the online application that asks age, sex, gender, etc.? I feel it can be used to kick out an application on fit, healthy, very experienced in security and frauds for corporates. Yeah. So, you know, these age and gender pieces are actually brought in to try and avoid discrimination, Tony. But I could see your concern and why it might work against you. Let's talk about age discrimination as a whole, right? So the first thing to say is if you're over 55 in particular, over 50 even, I would only put the last 15 years worth of experience on your CV. I would also take any schooling dates or graduation dates off of there and any indicator that might play to somebody's subconscious or conscious bias around your age. So eliminate you know, any obvious signs, OK, which will allow you to get in front because I actually believe that people discriminate by age subconsciously rather than deliberately. And so we've got to eliminate those cues which drive that behavior. So that'd be my first thing to say. My second uh, thing to say would be that when you're going through one of these applications, you can refuse to give certain data, okay? So age, sex, and gender are never mandatory fields. They're not allowed to be mandatory fields um, until you join the organization. So. You can refuse to give that data as part of your application too. Will, how are you doing? Andrew, can you run through the posting strategy for the new viewers to the session? Yeah, I'd absolutely love to. So let's talk about a LinkedIn playbook for you all. So you're a job seeker right now. I'm going to give you a LinkedIn playbook that you can execute yourself in January to increase your following, increase the amount that you're showing up in searches and increase the amount of inbound leads and approaches for jobs that you're getting. So it's going to have a, a few different parts to it. The first thing I want you to do is to draft a long form article. OK, and this long form article you're going to publish, it's going to be 800 to 900 words and it's going to be an evergreen thing. So if you're in marketing, it could be the four major trends in marketing for the next 12 months, for 2021 in the new digital age. Yeah. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to publish that. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to go through that article and out of that article, so say it was the four things for marketing, you're going to take each one of those four things and repurpose them into individual posts. Yeah. So if the first thing is the big trend in marketing is digital, you're going to pull out your paragraph on digital and just reformat that as a short form post that you put out. If the second thing is on uh, customer experience, you're going to reform that. You get it? So out of that one piece, you're then going to get into a situation whereby you've actually got five updates. Yeah. Because a lot of the barriers people have is what should I post about? So write an article that will appeal to your target audience. Like think about your next employer, your next boss in your mind when you write that article. Aim it at their pain. Atomize it into four other updates. All of a sudden now you've got five posts that you can distribute over the next two weeks. So that's the posting side. To further augment that and make it work for you, you want to be commenting three times a day at least on other posts in your sector. So get out there, comment on other posts in your sector, because we're really finding that LinkedIn is rewarding people that are paying into the algorithm, as well as just trying to extract out of it by passing out. So put a reminder to yourself to leave three comments every day. That's really going to help your posting. And don't add external links. The moment you put an external link in to a post, your engagement will go down because they don't want people leaving the platform and going off. And the only other th thing to say is make sure you're replying to comments. Anyone who comments on any of your posts or articles or anything like that, Reply to a comment in the first hour to two hours because that helps keep it in the feed. There's a misunderstanding that when you post that everyone sees what you're doing, they don't, right? It LinkedIn pushes, pushes your post to a small group of people and based on that engagement decides whether it goes further. So that's it really, that's the posting playbook. That's in essence what I did at the start of last year and I added 50,000 personal followers last year following nothing more complicated than that. Now. Following on from that, if you want to start getting into championing posts and uh, videos and all of the other stuff that comes with it, then good on you. But as a real kind of start for 10, if you're a leader on here right now, you've got knowledge, um, share your knowledge generously, article repurposed and kick on from there. And use the hashtag Job Search Hacks Live if you like. Then other people who are on here might pick your post up, might comment and support on it for you. Ian's back. Happy New Year to you, sir. Heard this week that you need to tweak your CV each week on the search portals to stay near the top of 
the search lists. Yeah, that's right. So you're talking about job boards, right? So you're Indeed, Monster, Job Site, CW Jobs, these kind of things. Whenever you refresh, you update a refresh CV, it does keep you towards the top of the job portal. So that's a very, very good uh, point. And don't write the job portals off, right? I mean, obviously, LinkedIn has murdered them in terms of market share, right? But don't write them off. Still worth using job portals. Uh, find out which which big job boards are there. I know a lot of internal uh, teams. So by internal teams, I mean HR teams, talent acquisition teams, internal recruitment teams still have a number of job board licenses. So well worth doing. Anne's in with us. How are you, Anne? Uh, very happy new year to you. Easy in apply on LinkedIn and other search portals. Is there any value in lease, in using these to apply for roles? Yeah, there is. I revert to my previous uh, comment, mind down, which is you've got a less than 1% chance of getting an interview. But yes, there is an easy apply. So my, my strategy would be pretty straightforward. If it's a job which is branded, where you can see who it reports into, a business that you really want to go after, then make the application, but then find a way to influence it. You know, get referred in, send voice notes to the hiring leaders, write to them in the post, like leave no stone unturned in getting yourself the opportunity to, you know, attend that interview and, and assess each other. If it's just something that you kind of like, yeah, fine, it's worth throwing my hat in the ring, then I think easy apply is probably the way to go. Yeah. And it's kind of the same with cover letters. Like I wouldn't spend a load of time on a cover letter for something you weren't sure about. I'd only spend a load of time on a cover letter when you could really give a compelling why and what you're going to bring to the table why that opportunity means something to your head and your heart and why you can add value to them right so not all job adverts are equal and you need to qualify them like a salesperson would qualify a lead but check yourself into job advert rehab all of you all of you check yourself into job advert rehab that is my number one uh, tip for today you'll be amazed i have to confess 14 percent of the 220 people or so that we helped get hired last year in the executive career jump club did get their roles via advert. So it's not a complete waste of time, but shouldn't be the only thing that you're doing. Alex, welcome back. Looking at starting my own consultancy business while still looking for perm or interim roles after completing a couple of qualifications shortly. Good for you. And we're seeing a lot of people do this, Alex. You know, there's a lot of people who are saying, well, I can't find the work I want, so I'm going to go and create it. And as I said earlier, the quickest way to a decent permanent role right now in some markets may actually be to start on a consulting or interim basis. Any tips on whether to start as a sole trader or a limited company? I would start as a limited company is the short answer. You can get these things set up. The other option is, the other option would be the umbrella companies. You know, there's like these third parties that can get you up and going quickly. But if you've got time, I would set up a limited company. Reason for that is by putting a brand out there associated with that limited company, you tend to pick up more of the consultancy stuff. Yeah. So as a sole trader or uh, going for one of the umbrellas, you might be able to do a little bit of contracting and that kind of thing. But if you actually want to do consultancy, I would set up a limited company. I would get a value proposition together. I'd get content stream going and I'd go for it that way. All you need to do is make it clear, though, on your profile that you're still open to both interim and permanent roles on top to make sure that it didn't stop people approaching you. So make sure it's, you know, make sure when you add your limited company that your job title is all the things you'd want to be found for and that your narrative underneath your current job makes it clear you're still open to permanent and interim. So we've done this for a few people recently and that the, the text you need to put under your new company is something like, um, uh, whilst continuing to look for the right longer term interim and permanent role, spot the opportunity to set up a niche consultancy in this space, solving these kind of problems, successfully winning at, uh, initial assignments. Yeah. So it's just, it's just blatant what you're trying to do. Hope that makes sense, mate. Good, good luck with it. Lots of people connecting with each other, which absolutely love. What else is going on? Question. Oh, no. I'm, I moved all around. This thing just dives all around on me. Sorry, gang. Bear with me. Right, I'm back. We really need to get a partner in crime, somebody to pick the, the comments out for me so that I could just sit here and answer them. But thank you for your patience. I'm trying my best here to get through to everybody. Emily, happy new year. Roles seem to be on LinkedIn for weeks. Do you think it is still worth applying or have they forgotten to take the job down? Mm. Well, the longer it's up there, the more I feel like they've forgotten to take the job down. Like some of these things are posted in an automated way, Emily. So 
when the job is uploaded into an ATS system or HR system, it gets auto posted on LinkedIn and they just set it for like four weeks. So it could be they're already interviewing for it. If it's something you really like the look of, again, I would go to the line manager. I wouldn't necessarily spend too much time applying for something that had been up for more than two weeks. I think that's important. Hey, sorry, I can't see your name. It's something to do with the security settings. Uh, other people on here will, will tell you about all of that. How to craft a networking message for head of department managers on LinkedIn when there may be no job openings but could use your skills to so eventually create one for you. Yeah. What I would say is uh, I wouldn't approach them for a job. So I think the error that most people make is that they link in with people and they go, got any jobs, mate? Here's my CV, right? <laughs> and and I, I get people doing that to me all the time. And, and when I was in post, I got people doing it to me all the, when I was in post. I guess I have got a job now. But when I was working for other people as an MD running search businesses, I used to get people doing that all the time. It was never that compelling. So I think when you link in with someone, a better message would be something like, I'm David, great uh, great to connect with you and see we've got a few mutual acquaintances such as Susan and Shane. If I can be of any value to you at any point, please let me know. I typically help people that are suffering from these kind of problems. So equally, if you know of any opportunities or anything crosses your desk, happy to have a chat. Keep in touch and we'll keep an eye out for your content. You know, something like that. Just don't spam your CV over. And if at all possible, do it via voice note. Do it via voice note. It's far more memorable and you get a far better response. Laz is back in. After 147 applications, I received my first interview. Brilliant. But there you go. As I said, lads, 1%. How to handle the telephone interviews. I'm feeling nervous. Right. Okay. Well, nerves is uh, understandable. And a certain amount of nerves is okay, right? It's an inverted U. You know about the inverted U theory. So we need a certain amount of anxiety to get to the peak of our performance, but too much and, and we'll tail off. So the best way to calm your nerves is to be really well prepared. So practice is everything, okay? Practice is absolutely everything. So I had a golf coach at one point in 2019, which was a waste of money because useless. But anyway, and he was fantastic, very patient. And he said to me, when you're on the driving range, so when you're on the practice range, you need to think about every single intricate little detail, right? And practice every single intricate little detail for hours on end. But when you go onto the course, you want to just go in and play. So the point being that by getting the practice in, you will feel more confident and you'll be able to be present in the conversation. So the types of things you want to be practicing are telling your story, like going back through your CV, be able to tell your story in a compelling way. We have the 555 model, which is tell your story in less than five minutes, cover five achievements and five learnings. Do not waffle on on that question. So many people waffle on and it kills it. They don't, they don't want you to read your CV when they ask you to run that back. So have that script, like five minutes that you're really pleased with. Be, have all your competency examples ready to go and you can reel those off and you're ready to go. Yeah. And, you know, speak to people you've worked with previously and ask them for feedback. Ask them about your strengths. Do some self-referencing. I found that's really good for your confidence. When you self-reference yourself, sometimes people remind you of strengths that when you've been on the market for a while, and let's face it, anyone could have been on the market for a while in this environment, that it, it just helps reinforce and get you back into the swing of things. So I really hope that helps, but get the practice in, lads. Record yourself if you need to, and let us know how you go. We wish you the absolute best of success. Michelle's in. How you doing? Would you always add open to work on a LinkedIn profile? No, I wouldn't. So there's, you know, there's a mix of opinions on this. Uh, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion. It's just a personal preference. I don't like the banner, the open to work banner personally, because I think it makes your profile picture look like everybody else's. I just think it's, it's just too over keen for me so i i don't really like it others disagree and that's absolutely uh relevant and fine it's it's pure opinion so no i don't i don't particularly like that banner personally i think by writing available and making sure that you're open to recruiters you can position yourself in a in a better way sophia arthur do you have a sample of the skill section cv please we did have a, a ats cv link going around uh previously so yeah i mean you know, I don't, I don't have uh, an example on me, but in essence, it's quite simple. You put an objective, then you put your six to eight key career achievements, and then you just put skills with some bullets and write the skills that your future boss would most want to see from you. That's what it's about. Sophia, how are you? I amended my CV. I didn't just apply for anything. I applied for a job through LinkedIn and was fortunately shortlisted. And they took her on. Fantastic. I think it's another success story. Sounds like 
two or three so far already this year uh, claiming that the job search hacks have helped them. So that's what this is all about. You know, if this helps another hundred people this year get hired, then as a community, we've done an awesome thing. So thank you all again uh, for being so involved. It's, it's fantastic. Victoria, I'm going no green banner. What's the current advice? <laughs> I've just covered that. I prefer no green banner, but write the word available in your headline to make it clear you're ready to go. What I'm hearing, so my background uh, is in executive search, right? And what I'm hearing is that that people are actually searching on the word available because they want people who can start quickly. So worth putting it in there. Can you tell me why my question came up as LinkedIn user? I cannot, but there are people in here who managed to fix that problem. It's something to do with settings or privacy or something like that, I believe. So I cannot. Sorry about that. Sarah, should you go back to companies you can see are still recruiting for the role if they said you were too expensive and you might be willing to drop a little bit now? Yeah, really good question. And Look, with a lot of, the, yeah, so we coach people around job search coaching, career coaching, day in, day out, right? 24-7, we're on this piece. And one of the most common questions at the moment is about should you drop your salary and should you consider dropping your salary and how do you position it? And my view is this, the, the three biggest indicators of job success and job engagement and, you know, what we need to do to turn around those Gallup poll findings where everyone said they weren't enjoying their work is, is based around three things. Does it give you some kind of progression? So not progression financially, but will you learn some stuff in there? Yeah. Do you identify with the purpose of the organisation? So is it a mission you're passionate about? Because I think that should play uh, a factor. And then thirdly, it's about the person. So, you know, it's worth going backwards in salary if you really, really buy into the person. So that's my thoughts around, you know, dropping salaries in this environment and whether it makes sense. It's, it's kind of those three things. I'll probably do a post about that at some point, thinking about it. Um, can you go back? Yeah, of course you can. What you might want to do is go back and offer offer it, uh, offer your skills on a consultancy or interim basis in the first instance. Yeah. Or offer to do it four days a week, but within their existing budget or something like that. It depends on the context. But yes, you can. The worst they can do is say no, at which point you would have lost Absolutely nothing. Nitin, how are you? I'm based in Belgium and would like to be part of the Executive Career Jump Club. Okay, great. Yeah, you can still uh, pay via the link. Thank you. Uh, look forward to collaborating with you. We've got uh, we've helped people in 14 countries uh, in the last 12 months. So loca it's a location agnostic. You can just sign up as normal. Are there any HR professionals you would recommend to assist with LinkedIn profiles and CVs? Yes, me. Website address is www.execcareerjump.com. Dot com, which is at the bottom there. So go on and have a look at our LinkedIn and CV package. That's part of what I do. Let's get back to the job search hacking. So Alistair, very good afternoon. Welcome. And thanks for joining uh, the other 200 people that have turned out again for us this year. I had that nerves around. I didn't know if anyone was going to turn out this year, but it seems like it's very, very relevant still, which is awesome. So I hate filling in the current or expected salary fields in online applications, but I'm worried I may be kicked out if you put a zero. Yeah, I hate that as well. So whenever you've got the opportunity and it's a free text field and it says salary expectations, just write market rate. Yeah, that you're willing to accept market rate because it's an unfair game when they're not disclosing the salary they're willing to pay, but they're asking you to disclose. But they're doing it. If you have to put something in, then you've got to put something which is probably competitive, but still at a level that you'd feel comfortable with. Yeah. You might have the opportunity to push up. A little bit once you've got in there, understood the size of the prize and qualified the opportunity. But you've really got to put in the least amount that, you know, you'd be happy to accept it on, haven't you? I mean, it's I don't like it. I don't like how it's so swung in their favour. Uh, but, yeah, the way to get that salary back up, as I say, is you've got to qualify the opportunity, Alistair, right? So really early on into any interview, say to them, fast forward 12 months, what would have to happen for you to feel like this has been a massive success? Yeah. And get them to put a number on it. So we'd have saved this amount of money or we'd have grown by this amount of money. Like find out what the impact of your hire is. And then when it comes to salary, refer to those numbers, because then you're positioning your salary as an investment rather than just as a, a basic wage or cost. Sophie, how are you doing? Do you think there is a hack to actually get your application viewed? Applied so many and get the generic response back. Do you think it's apply within the first day or so, or how your CV looks, for example. No, there's no one hack. As I said earlier, the hit rate from job adverts is pants. You need to have a multi-channel approach. But there are things you can do to increase your chances. Namely, get an ATS compliant structure to your CV. So for those of you who don't know what ATS is, there's a trend to use AI screening tools behind the scenes that sit behind the job adverts. 
So when you apply to big companies now, it's rarely a human that's reviewing the CVs. It's an ATS machine that's going to scan those CVs and try and find the things that they're looking for. Now, that kind of makes sense because some of these applications are, you know, four or 500 CVs. And so the ATS is picking the top 20 matches and then the human will review those matches. So if your CV is an ATS compliant, and by that I mean if it isn't easily read, if it isn't free text, if it's got logos and different formats on it, that'll tend to get ranked down or the ATS won't be able to understand it properly. So make sure you're ATS compliant and then hit up those line managers directly like we spoke about earlier. But check yourself into job advert rehab, I'm telling you. There are so many better ways. Recruiters, headhunters, job boards, content, networking, direct approaches, writing to employees that you'd want to work for. Yeah. Finding a way to add value to people that you want to work for through recommendations or reviewing some of their stuff, doing a customer walkthrough for them. There is a whole heap of different things you can do that I think would be good. Is your boss not helping you? No. The boss and the gremlins have gone out for an hour's walk, Gary, uh, just so that we can get a peaceful broadcast, which was which was much appreciated. The lockdown is like trying to broadcast live with two uh, primary school age gremlins running around the place. Doesn't work. So she's taking them out. Uh, Darren, you said uh, to connect with the hiring manager, the names are rarely on the role description. How do you find those? Yeah, good question, Darren. Thanks for, for asking that. So what it will say, whilst it won't say their name, you're correct. Uh, absolutely right on that is reporting into the head of marketing, right? Or reporting into the VP marketing EMEA, for example. I don't know why I keep using marketing today, but let's roll with it. I'd, I had two clients this morning um, who I was coaching who are both in marketing, so it's obviously in my mind. So uh, let's say that in the job description or in the job advert, Darren, it says reporting to VP marketing EMEA. Quite simply, copy that job title, put it into the LinkedIn search bar, select people, yeah? Then select current employer and type in the employer. Drill down by location if you have to, but typically that will get you an idea of who it is who's on the other side of that hiring decision. And that's when you need to get after them and try and influence it. Back in the day for internet, I wrote to companies HR speculatively. Is it still useful? Do you know what it is? We started doing this last year, Tony, and it's amazing. I always think, and this is, you know, marketing 101, isn't it? But I always think what everybody, everybody's doing you want to fly in the opposite direction in some regards. So, you know, 99% of people, this is a fact, uh, for those of you that think that LinkedIn's already saturated, 99% of people on LinkedIn never post, okay? That's coming from LinkedIn directly itself. I was on a, a broadcast with Doug, who's the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn, last night, uh, interacting about this stuff. And he's like, yeah, well, it's still early days in terms of getting people posting. It's still early days, right? I'm like, wow, I just, you know, this assumption that it's saturated is wrong. So, Posting is actually flying against what most people are doing. But in this digital age, what we don't get so much of anymore is post, right? We're bombarded by messages and emails, but we're not getting post. So we found that writing to target employers uh, in a really tailored way, enclosing your CV, cover letter, having a really good why around why you want to work with them, actually is going to get a good open rate and a good level of engagement. So absolutely give it a crack. For the cost of a few stamps, Excuse me, it's got to be worth it. Question. My question seemed to disappear, so writing it again. Okay, well, you've made me disappear with your lengthier question now, but that's probably a welcome relief for everyone. I'm only looking for part-time work as I'm building my own e-commerce business. Firstly, I'm finding it difficult to find part-time roles, yeah. And secondly, when applying for them, I'm also finding it tricky on applications to make it explicit. I'm looking for part-time hours without sounding uh, work shy or that I'm not fully committed, yeah. Rather than searching for part-time, search for freelance. I've seen a real move away. So part-time permanent work is far less uh, common now than freelance. People are using freelance. So just rebrand, reorientate towards freelance work rather than part-time. Um, I think that's going to be definitely the best way to go. Sean's taking her advice and she's starting a new job. We absolutely love it. We absolutely love it. I'll count you in the stats as well. What's that then? Four so far this year that are saying in the job search hacks community are saying that, that this has helped them get over the line. I know you've worked with Neil Ewington. Um, we've got an early careers ca academy that, that Neil runs and is the, the main owner of that we're, we've invested in, which is fantastic. And I know Sean's been part of that. So anyone on here who's earlier into their career, talk to Sean about that. It's worth looking at. Update. Never give up. Brilliant. I was contacted last night for a vacancy apply for at the beginning of November. Good. Yeah. Plant enough seeds. Yeah. Plant enough seeds. You know, 
people um, people are having you know, so much to deal with internally and the goalposts are on wheels are at the moment. So you are going to find delays between different parts of the recruitment process. There's some things you can do to push these things along, but equally, you are just going to find delays and you need to try and, whilst obviously you're going to be anxious to get in there and get meeting them, you need to try and manage that and show a bit of empathy and understanding for the fact that a lot of these companies are also carrying a load of rubbish. Equally, some of them are terrible at communicating and ghosting and not getting back to us. And that's totally unacceptable from them. So, you know, I totally recognise that. But equally, we are seeing this a lot where people haven't heard for a while and then suddenly an offer turns up or an interview turns up. So don't be surprised if you find that happening. Recently attended a second round interview of three interview rounds and the appointing business unexpectedly appointed at second round with no negative feedback. I emailed after rejecting, thank you for the interview and leaving contact details. Is it okay if it happens again? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, absolutely okay if it happens again. My final tip on that one is whenever you get rejected for anything is when you do your follow-up email is to ask for three things to work on for your next email uh, interview, right? Three things to work on. So don't ask for feedback, waste of time. Ask for three things to work on because they'll have to then tell you stuff that you might have had blind spots around. You might not like what they say, but it's invaluable. Competency interview, should you be throwing in key skills in the answer or assume this is obvious? And how do you best slim down your star examples when I have so many to choose from? Thanks, Dominic. Yeah, well, one one thing you can do, Dominic, is in the interview is ask the interviewer, say to the interviewer, I've got three examples. One is this, two is that, and three is that. Which one would you be most interested in to see as most relevant? So I'd give them the option rather than trying to second guess which one's best. In terms of slimming down competency answers, we say you want to make it about 50% of the time length that you would naturally make it. So more like, particularly on video, right? So more like three to four minutes. But what you want to do is finish on a question. So be brave enough to keep your competency answers far shorter, but finish on a question. So if they ask you about stakeholder management, tell them about that difficult FD who didn't believe in what you were doing and that what you observed was that they'd had a bad experience with HR in the past. And so you as the new HR person had to win their trust and Talk about all the different things around how you went about that, what the result was, and then finish with, does that give you what you need or is there any more detail you'd like on that? Yeah. So that rather than what a lot of people do, which is you vomit every single detail and every single key skill into the answer, keep the, give them the executive summary, but give them the interview, the opportunity to drill down on the elements they want rather than talking and talking and talking and hoping what they're looking for somewhere in there. Yeah. That's how you package it. That's how you, you get the win for this. And whilst we're on star, uh, whilst we're on star interview questions, I spend a lot of time doing interview coaching, right? With people who are super, super capable, like people, so I, I interview coach with some of the, the top leaders, right? And all of them have a very, very similar challenge. They are amazing at what they do. But when they answer star questions, the A bit, the action gets completely lost. And so everyone makes it sound too easy. So they go, yeah, well, this was a situation and they, they normally describe that really well and they give some context and they normally talk about the result now very well. But the bit in the middle, they make it sound way too easy and they don't talk about what they did. They don't talk about their playbook that, you know, there's no you need to bring some drama and some narrative into these stories. So, you know, appeal to the human side, the journey that you had to go on to get the result, the different levers that you pulled, the moment when you thought it wasn't going to happen, but you managed to get it over the line. That's what the interview that's what's going to engage the interviewer. And particularly any playbooks around, you know, how you approached it. And by playbook, I mean, you know, methodology. So my methodology in terms of how I go around this is a three-step process, which is bang, bang, bang. Yeah. By telling them you've got a methodology, that really gives me confidence that you could do it again. So star competency-based interviews. Let's surmise that for anyone who's listening, who's got competency-based interviews this week or so. Number one, make it half the length that you normally would, but finish on a question and give the interviewer uh, the opportunity to drill down further. Number two, spend more time on the action part of the answer than any other. And number three, when you're in that action area, share your playbook, your approach, and build things into models or strategies that are easy to digest and will give them confidence you can do it again. That's what I'm tending to be helping people with. Mariana's back in. How do you know when you use an ATS CV version or more creative version when applying? I work in PR, so it's important to me that creativity comes across. Yeah, it is. So this would be a good example, wouldn't it, of where you might want to apply using your ATS version and then maybe send something more creative. But I'd go 
you know, more would you create, you know, some examples of your work or something direct to the line manager. Yeah. But you have to apply with the ATS version if it's a large organization. If it's a smaller organization, so more of a boutique, so, you know, a creative marketing agency of 20 to 50 people type thing, Mariana, you'll be fine using your creative version straight up. Great point from Glenn. If you are asked for an informal chat with a prospective employer, treat it as formal. I put a post out about that not so long ago, and he is bang on. There is no such thing as an informal chat. So many people get blindsided. They turn up expecting a chit chat or a rubber stamping. I'll just have a quick chat with the CEO before we offer you or, yeah, a, you know, a, a get together with HR. You turn up and they're still assessing you. Until you start on day one, every communication, every email, every phone call, everything is part of both parties assessing each other. And it is a two way process. Don't let anybody tell you because of the current market, it's not a two way process. You need to be reverse interviewing as thoroughly as they are interviewing you, if not more, because you have value to bring. They are the ones with the challenge, not you. And so make sure you're qualifying them as much as they're qualifying you, because you'll interview better if you go in with that mindset. How does one stay motivated and not disheartened during the job search, uh, which can take over a year? Yeah, it's hard, right? We talk about uh, people falling into the jabs, which is job acquisition burnout syndrome, which is, you know, something that we've made up. It's not a, a you know, a, a technical thing, a medical thing, but I really believe it exists, this jabs thing, which is, and the trouble is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because the more knockbacks you get, the more confidence gets hit, the more knockbacks you get, and the more your confidence gets hit. And you can really end up in a bad place with this stuff. Um, and quite often, you know, I'm, I'm working with people and they're already on that spiral and it's very, very, uh, uh, it's very, very brutal, actually. It's a really, really tough journey. So thank you for, for, for bringing this up because it's an important point. What I found is there are a number of things you can do to help you stay motivated. Number one is to buddy up with a with a with a job search buddy. So somebody else who you know, who you trust, or maybe somebody else that you've met on LinkedIn or in this stream who you catch up with fortnightly, probably about the right cadence, and you check in with each other. There's also you know various groups out there that can help you. Um, but job buddying is good. That structure thing we spoke about earlier is really, really good. Be kind to yourself, manage your own state when you know. When you know you're not in a good spot, withdraw for a little bit from the job search and give yourself a break. Get outside. Plenty of uh, exercising and all that kind of thing. And also, um, you know, add value. What I found is the more value you add, the more good we feel and the more confident we feel and the more motivated we feel because it reminds us of our value. So take on mentees or um, help uh, particular causes or people in your network that you're passionate about. That would be uh, that would be my view. But look after yourself. It's really important at the moment. Wow. I think we're time up. I think we're going to have to uh, wrap there. It's 10 past one. How did that happen? Still got 200 people with us. So obviously, uh, thanks so much for coming on the journey again with us. Fantastic to see so many people on here. Here's the petition uh, that Gary was talking about earlier. He shared that again. So please uh, do like that. And as I said earlier, my, my number one tip for lockdown is that structure piece. Make sure you're structuring your days. Make sure that you have a place in the house or the apartment you go to that is your spot for job searching because you are the CEO of your job search. And you need to go to that spot to make sure that you're productive and the, that you have a space whereby your brain clicks into job search mode. Definitely have a multi-channel strategy. Check yourself into job search rehab. Of course, apply for roles that look good for you but don't exclusively spend your time on job applications because it will not serve you well. And you can end up falling into that jab cycle very, very easy and doing a hell of a lot of work for not a lot of return. And implement that LinkedIn playbook, write an article, split it out, atomize it into four other updates. That's two weeks worth of content. Add comments to other people's comments. Go out there and search uh, people in your networks. Like your target employer's content. Use this platform. This is an incredible opportunity on LinkedIn in 2021. 99% of people still aren't posting, right? Make yourselves one of the 1%. It's a massive opportunity. I can I can tell you from personal experience and from what's happened with our clients, how big of an opportunity is. So please take action on that. When you are sharing your content, if you want to use hashtag job search hacks live, I check that uh, personally from time to time, as do a number of other people in this stream. So we'll try and get on and support you if you are sharing stuff with the job search hacks live. Um, if, if somebody could take a screen print for me, that would be really useful because uh, it's the first time that we've got the new Exec Career Jump logo on. So if you could do that very shortly. 
Thank you if you just did that. By all means, uh, send that to me or do your own update. Help me spread the word. The more people we can get in this community, the more people we can impact. Like for me, it's just about our North Star, which is all about our purpose of trying to end job search misery. That's why we're doing this. So please help me spread the word, share what you've learned of this session, encourage people to join us next week and be kind to yourself. Happy New Year, everyone. Good to see you. Let's get to work.